The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons B, and this is The Anxious Achiever the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. One of the things I love best about hosting the show is the community we've created. It can be so lonely, so lonely to deal with mental health challenges, and many people still suffer in silence. But since starting the show, I've heard from so many of you who are working to fight stigma, who are coming forward and telling their story, and who are making work better and healthier for everybody. You know, almost three years into the pandemic, the good news is that we're talking about this stuff in the open. But we're also now in a moment, call it return to work meets quiet quitting, That feels really uncertain, messy, and scary. A lot of people also ask me questions. They want advice. And so to kick off the new season of The Anxious Achiever, we're going to answer some of those questions. Later in the show, I'll bring in Callie Yost, CEO and founder of the Flex Strategy Group, to talk about remote and hybrid work in particular. But first, we have Amelia Ransom. She's VP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Smartsheet, with over 20 years of experience in HR. I want us to talk to Amelia about all things mental health and work, especially now in this particular moment. I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. I have had over these past few years, really memorable conversations with you and I value your counsel. So. I'm going to give you a bunch of questions from listeners that are relevant to work you currently do or work you've done over your career. And I think this is really helpful because I don't know about you, but I think that people are just really confused about what work is right now. I would absolutely agree with that. And I would say I think people are really reevaluating the role that work plays in their life. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. That's that's a shift and a change that I see people grappling with, redefining and defining again. And frankly, I think it's a very healthy place for us to be. It feels a little scattered right now, but I actually think it's a very healthy tension for us to hold. I have to imagine that this is making employers anxious too, though. Oh, because their role has changed in our lives. Absolutely. The ranking, right? The staff ranking that people did, it was really what is my job? Where is my employment? You know, even geographically, where will I do that? For whom will I do that? The the staff ranking for employment was really high. Mm -hmm. And I think it was sort of a foregone conclusion that that would be really high. And I think now what employees are saying is, maybe that's not so high anymore. Maybe I've got other things that I want to put in the top one or two spots in my life. And my identity might not be as meshed with who I work for and what I do. I think that's right. And I think who I work for is taking on a different value, right? Are the values aligned? Are we aligned in relationship versus this is a brand marquee name? I want to be associated with it. I think it it still has importance. It's just taking on a different importance. Hmm. And so maybe the work that we do is important, but also important is how we do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it ethical? Do I feel good at the end of the day about the people I work with? Um, The way that we get work done, the how and the why are becoming as important as the what. Well, thank goodness. Exactly. (laughs) Right. I think. And again, that's why I say, like, I think this is a very healthy place to be. Does this make employers anxious? Yes. Yeah, I think so. And I also think that's a good thing. These are things we need to grapple with. 
as employers, we cannot assume that people will just want to work for us because of just the brand and the way that we defined brand in the past. So I think these are things that we've always been kind of under those covers that we need mm-hmm. to bring out into the sunlight, right? My father used to tell me all the time, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Yes. <laughs> so we need to air these things out and align ourselves to who we are, why we are, how we see ourselves in the future, and then communicate those things to our employees. I think we all do better when we do that. So I think the level of anxiety or discomfort that people are feeling, you know, I Googled it a few days ago, yet no one has died of discomfort. And so we'll all be okay. (laughs) I did actually Google it a few days ago. You're kidding. No. What comes up? (laughs) Oh, I don't know. I like, (laughs) don't Google it. But yet no one, like, we'll all be okay. Okay. I'm going to shift to a more mental health focused question. This is sort of an obvious, but it's a tough question. How do I let my boss know that I need to take a mental health day, week, or month? I think that's the right question. And I think about it like coming on the same side of the table with someone. We have something we both want to solve. Rather than pushing the puck and trying to challenge the manager to see how they're going to show up and using it as a test, to say, I need a mental health day. Let me see what my manager says. I've, I've seen that almost as a challenge mm-hmm. and a test that, that the manager doesn't know they're taking. And I understand that. It can also be unfair. If we come along on the same side of the table to say, we have things we want to solve and do together. This is what I need to show up better. Mm-hmm. This is what I need to be able to show up and help us accomplish our goals Here's what mapping that out looks like. I need some time away for X reasons or to do this. This is how I intend to come back and show up. Can we talk about that together? Mm. How do we have a dialogue together rather than me saying, you know what, tomorrow I need to shut my laptop. Things aren't working well for me, but I I gotta go. (laughs) You can do it that way. Things happen immediately. I understand that. But if you have the option of time, Come alongside and sit on the same side of the table and think about the challenge that you're both looking at the challenge together rather than, you know, a hockey puck that you're sort of pushing back and forth. Yeah. But I want to sit here. I want to share some things. I want to be able to show up well. I need to take a little time away because my family or my health or whatever. And this is how I want to come back. And I want to stay in conversation with you in these ways, so that when I'm back, I can really be back. You're pointing towards a shared future. Mm, Yes. Which is so important. Yeah, I am, aren't I? I didn't even, I hadn't really thought about it like that, but that's absolutely right. I will also just add a, a personal note here for anyone who is thinking about doing this. You don't have to try to explain how serious your mental illness is or how bad you feel. It's really tempting to explain your depression and, and try to make them see how bad it is. That's You don't have to do that. Amen. Doctor's notes or notes from your psychiatrist or psychologist, very helpful. I fully, fully agree. You know, as someone that's, who's had cancer, I didn't feel the need to explain yeah. that. Yes. I, I really didn't. Like, this is what's happening. This is how I intend to approach this. These are the things that are happening. And I really didn't. I didn't feel a need to explain it to the level that I think you're right. People do feel like they need to over explain. Depression is a real thing. It's as real as cancer. It's as real as anything else that happens. And to your point about employers, I think more than ever, again, some are bumbling around in the dark. I understand that. But more than ever, I think employers are beginning to really understand that. Okay. Well, here's a follow up. What if it's not about me taking time off work or mental health leave, but it's really about helping them understand I need boundaries. Like, no, I'm sorry, I can't be in the office more than two days a week now. Mm -hmm. I would say, what are the goals and how do we accomplish the goals? Let's bring it back to what we're attempting to do. Mm. What are the outcomes we're seeking? If managers are leading with, I need to see butts in seats, I think that's an antiquated way of getting it done, to be honest with you. We, we've got to move past that as leaders, as managers, as employers. What are the goals and outcomes and how can we accomplish them? 
So if I'm that person and I'm feeling pressure to be in the office more than I can be in the office, that's the conversation I want to have with my manager. Right. How can I give you confidence that I can accomplish this? What are we trying to accomplish? And how can I give you confidence that I'm able to accomplish that even if I'm not in the office two days or three days a week or whatever it is? A question I get a lot to this point, Amelia, is this is a company-wide dictate. Like I have a friend who works for Apple, right? And, and they had Monday and Wednesday as the days of the week you're supposed to be in the office, which is really stupid because if you don't live near the office, <laughs> then, Correct. then you're right. So is that something that a manager can say, you know what, this is a stupid rule. I know it's company policy, but I'll make a dispensation for you or for my team. Sometimes managers can do that. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that managers can do And employees can do also, of course, individual contributors can do also, is share that feedback with leadership. They need to understand what a pain point it is for the organization and for managers. Hmm. So if I'm in a leadership meeting, one of the things we might talk about in the leadership meeting is what our pain points are. And if I bring up the fact that people are pushing back on being in the office, well, my colleague Maura might say, you know what, I'm hearing that from my team as well. And then my colleague, you know, so-and-so might say, I'm hearing that as well. Now we understand we have an org-wide problem. It's not just my one team member. Yes. So that's the value of elevating and bringing that conversation to the right places. Because the end of the day, if your competitors aren't requiring that, you can see the logical end. <laughs> yes. Don't come at me, Apple. But maybe, maybe that's <laughs> not, right? But maybe you don't get the best talent. Okay. Rick writes. I suffer from bipolar, have all my life. There's a piece of me that is compelled to write about it and go public, but I have been afraid of the stigma. What are your thoughts as an HR person? Rick, I feel you. I see you. I would say to you that your liberation in your life will enable other people to be liberated. Hmm. So I don't want to put that on Rick, that it is his responsibility to do. But I would say if you can do it and it will free you because it will free you, even if it hurts. My father used to say the truth will set you free, but it will try to wrestle you to the ground first. (laughs) His truth might wrestle him to the ground first. It might, but he will be free at the end of it. And there are other people who need to be free. And so if you can do that, then I say do it because two things will be true. Again, you'll be free and others will be free as well. Amelia, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but once he discloses a medical condition like bipolar, is he covered under ADA or any new protections? To your point, I am not an attorney, but I will say my professional opinion is yes. Yeah, Because the ADA covers those who have a disability and bipolar does qualify as a disability. So I believe the answer is yes. Again, not an attorney. Okay. I'm going to ask you the elephant in the room. And this is literally a question I get all the time. I'm sure you're hearing about it too. And it's kind of sensitive and it's about boundaries. What do you do if you're a manager and you have someone asking for time off for mental health and you aren't quite sure if it's serious or if it's just someone wanting time Is there a good balance there? We want to believe people, but we don't want to be taken advantage of. I also want to add in, I'm hearing from people that they are having vulnerable conversations. They're asking people to disclose. And then there's a person or two on the team who disclose too much. People feel uncomfortable. They take up too much time in the discussion. All these new things that managers aren't trained to do. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the beginning of the question, which is someone shares, do I believe them? How much information do I need? I would say as a manager, your job isn't to collect that information. Okay. It is not your job as the manager to feel like you have to be the arbiter of whether someone is or is not telling the truth about their mental health or their disorder or disease or anything like that. So I think managers should take that burden off of them. That's where HR can be your partner. Mm. So if someone discloses to you, then you need to help them get to their HR professional, their benefits person or whatever. Your job is to enable them to have the right conversations. So that's thing one. You know, should I believe them or not believe them? Don't make that your job. Well, she can literally say, let me call up Amelia. Yes. (laughs) And bring her into the conversation. Thank you for sharing that with me. I thank you for trusting 
me with that information. Let's make sure we're having the right dialogues with the right people. So let me bring in some partners. Here's what I intend to do. So inform your employee of what you intend to do, Mm -hmm. of who you intend to tell. Also, managers, great reminder, you don't need to tell everybody's business to everybody else. The reason people don't trust managers is because sometimes you tell your colleague and your colleague doesn't need to know. So tell the people you intend to tell, but inform the person of what you intend to do so that you keep the trust in that relationship. Thank you for telling me. I need to grab some partners. Here's who I intend to bring in. Boom, boom, boom. And then you move that conversation along and have your partners alongside you for that. Most people are not attempting to just get free time off by using mental health as the way to take a vacation. No, of course not. Most people are not doing that. And we do a disservice to people who are truly struggling with their mental health, who need time away. We do them a disservice when we suggest that that is the case because it truly isn't the case. I've been in HR a long time. Are there people who take advantage? Absolutely. I would say in my career, that's been one, two percent of people at best. Wow. So most people aren't out here trying to take advantage of it. That's the first thing. Bring your partners along. The second thing. So another question I've gotten, and again, I've heard this a lot from managers is, I'm really, I'm trying, I'm trying to have vulnerable conversations. We're talking about mental health at work. But when I do it in a team or group setting, it seems like there's always one person, right, who monopolizes the conversation or overshares. And I can I can see people get uncomfortable. I, I'm not a therapist. What should I do? I love that question because it tells me the manager is really trying to support this person and support their team. So kudos to this manager. I think that an important thing to do is take that person to the side. Hmm. Have a separate conversation with that person because you're right. It typically is one person or two people and say, you seem to have a lot going on. How can I best support you? Mm. Our team may not be able to fully support what you need. How can I, as your leader, best support you? Right? So make sure you're, you're dialed in with that person. And what are the boundaries you establish for the team going into a conversation like that? Mm. And I think the conversations are great, but you might, I've often recommended that people open up meetings by saying, how are you? And waiting for real answers. And that is fine. But if someone crosses a boundary, and I don't, again, that boundary might be different in different team settings. The other thing is, how do I prepare my team to support their colleagues when they say, when I ask a question that might say, how are you doing at the opening of a team meeting? and someone acknowledges that they were dealing with anxiety over the weekend, have I prepared my team to hold that in confidence? Mm. That doesn't need to be shared widely. That it isn't their job to analyze this person, to walk around them with kid gloves. That isn't their job. But to be able to show up in a supportive way. Mm -hmm. Have, Have I had that conversation with my team of how to be in community with someone who discloses it. Because that would not be an over-disclosure. That would just be a, how was your weekend? And someone says, gosh, my anxiety was really high this weekend. I'm really working through that. And perhaps the right answer is, thank you for sharing that. And it helps me show up with you in a better way this week. That's it. Maybe that's the answer for them, but it, it, it has to happen on both sides. Do you think managers need to get trained in all of this stuff? And have you seen success with outside consultants coming in or, you know, people who actually know how to have these vulnerable conversations? Or is this something that is that you're seeing managers sort of building a homegrown knowledge base in? Managers are absolutely building it themselves. Yes, we need to educate managers But it has to be ongoing education. It can't just be training, right? Mm. The way that we typically think about training. Yeah. Where I hire a consultant, we do the thing, we go, we, you know, sort of (laughs) clean our hands afterwards and we go, we're good. No, it has to be ongoing because I need to build this as a muscle of leadership and management, not just a one-time conversation. So yes, we need to continue to do that at all costs and, and managers are figuring it out by themselves. 
But I always say, you don't have to be someone's therapist. No. Right? That please is not don't. your job. Right. No, please don't. No. I'm, I'm ill-equipped to do that for someone. But I can enable. My job as a leader is typically to enable. It's not about fixing. I'm just going to ask this question. It's a little bit similar to, to what we've asked, but Loretta wrote in and says she's had a hard few years at work. She's a highly sensitive person with an anxiety disorder. How have employees or how do you recommend employees advocate for their needs when their disability may not be visible to their employer? I would recommend saying it. it maybe you need to practice how you're going to say it. But I really just recommend saying it. And I'll go back to this coming on the same side of the table. People couldn't see my cancer either. It was not visible to the naked eye. So I'm going to need to communicate that to you and help you support me because you don't know best what I need. I know best what I need. Mm -hmm. So we have to do this in community together. Sometimes I see employees saying, this is my problem. Okay, now fix it. I can't do that alone. I need to be in partnership and community and conversation with you in order to do that. And I see employers sometimes saying, hands off, I don't know what you need. Like, I don't know what to tell you. That too is not right because we have tools and resources and we might say, would this work? Would this work? We've tried this before. Could that be something that could work? So we need to serve up some solutions also but we've got to do this together. So I recommend saying it to a leader that you trust in your organization, to HR, to someone that you think you can have an open, honest dialogue with, practice it if you need to. Mm -hmm. I know it can be hard to say. When I said out loud that I had cancer, it was like, every time I said it out loud, it was more real. Oh, yeah. Right? And I don't want to conflate my cancer with someone's depression or anxiety. I'm not trying to conflate those things, but I am trying to say I'm using the tools of that Mm -hmm. to inform how I think people should show up in these conversations. But you've got to say it with words. You can't expect people to know, and you should expect your employer to show up at the table with you. I love your point about practicing. Practicing is good Mm -hmm. if you're anxious. Yes. (laughs) Yes, yeah, say it in the mirror if you need to. Record yourself on a Zoom call and, and listen to it. And, you know, these are things we can do. But yeah, don't try to go into a cold. That's really hard. That's really hard. Okay, last question and kind of related. And I've heard this from some of my Anxious Achiever listeners, especially people who feel sort of social anxiety or they get anxiety in difficult conversations. Do you think there's a relationship between overworking and being afraid to ask for what you want? I feel like I've just been keeping my head down and overproducing in hopes that someone will give me a raise, but I'm scared to ask for one. Ah, I understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Yes. The days of, if I just work harder, they'll notice me and they'll give me everything that's in my mind that I think I deserve, but I've never articulated with words is done. (laughs) Have the funeral for it hire the second line band, but it's done. What do you want? What do you need? Again, a theme here, have a conversation and don't do this part, which I see very often. People, when they're going into conversation to ask for what they want, they've written the script. (laughs) They've decided what they're going to say, but they've also decided what the other person needs to say. But the other person doesn't have that script. So they don't know their lines. So we've decided, I'm going to say this, they're going to say this, and then she's going to say no, and I'm going to tell her off, and she's going to... Don't write the whole conversation. (laughs) Just write your part. Okay? Just just write your lines. (laughs) Have we not all been guilty of this? I know I have. (laughs) Yes. But write your lines. Don't write the other person's lines. So if you need to do that, you need to have a conversation, you need to bring it forward, great. By all means, yesterday, do it. But be open and willing to understand it might be someone's first time dealing with this as well. Mm. And if they show up in a way that suggests that they want to be partnered with you and they want to help you solve it, then absolutely, let's do that. The other thing I would say, if you are 
working so hard and feel like it's not getting noticed. Yeah. I think there are two things potentially at play. Are you working on the right things and have you confirmed that? Mm. Sometimes we work on the things we like to work on, the things that bring us joy, Mm -hmm. but don't bring the company value. So first align on whether or not you are working on the right things. Because that may be why nobody's noticing them because nobody cares about the thing you're working on because nobody asked you to do it and you're doing it because it serves something in you. Right? Right. Right. Two is if you have a line that you are working on the right things and you have said, this is the value that I think I'm adding. I believe I'm working on the right things. You have alignment on that. Then you have an opportunity to say, wow, I think I've done a great job at this, this, or this. Can we talk about how I think I should be compensated, rewarded. This is what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to get promoted. I'm looking for a raise. I'm looking for this. Is that in line with what you're thinking? Don't go into detail. Yeah. Mm -mm. Can we align on what recognition and reward look like? I just find we're sometimes making assumptions, I guess is what I'm saying. We're making assumptions. And I find this at Many levels, to be honest with you. I find this at every level in a company where people are expecting one thing and then they get a different thing. It's because we didn't align yeah. on what that looked like. Well, and when you're anxious, anxiety is an unreliable narrator, right? So you're seeing the world through your own rose-colored glasses, but you're also anxious. So you're seeing the world yes. in a way that may not be the perspective of other people. That's right. And I think you're right about that. Again, you know, I will quote the late, great Jean Ransom Sr., which is an anxiety I understand is not just a feeling. So I'm not trying to conflate anxiety with just a feeling. But my father used to say, your feelings will lie to you. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing. New currencies come and go. Decades of savings lost in days. All showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Work has really changed in the past few years. We're now talking about mental health at work, which is great. But I would say the biggest sea change is the evolution of the conversation and the realities around working remotely and now working hybrid. So I spoke to Callie Yost, CEO and founder of the Flex Strategy Group, to answer some of your questions about working remotely and what it means for your mental health, your management, and your future success. I was thinking about how I was going to ask you to frame this moment of work that we're in. And like, I was reading one of your posts and you said, how do you do all the good things? with a culture when 50% of your workforce is on site full time, because 44% of people have to be on site and 6% want to be. And then you've got a third of your workforce who wants to be on site some days, but yeah, they love working at home. So they're in and out. And then 17% you say, is never coming back to the office. They are total work from homers. And when I hear numbers like that, I just think, oh my gosh, this is so messy. Yeah, you know, it's, but it really requires looking at work from a totally different perspective, right? Like Mm. we're so used to looking at work from the perspective of where, leading with the where, (laughs) right? We got to lead with the what, which is what are we trying to do? What is the work that we do? And then how, when, and where do we do that best? And for an organization that let's say that's the most recent Gallup data. So, you know, again, let's take that as a gauge, right? Like who knows exactly where it's going to land, but that's a gauge right now of what people prefer. And you have to include everyone in that strategy. You can't just be focusing on the 56% who wants some type of flexibility. You can't Mm. do that you have to really look at everybody. So that includes the people who have to be on site because of their jobs, but they could have a different type of flexibility, let's say a flexibility in the way that they work and the way that they coordinate their schedules and the time that they work. So if you ask that question of everyone, what do we need to do and how, when, and where do we do that best? Then that allows those different aspects of your organization to figure out 
what that flexibility or that flexible work model is going to look like for them. And you're approaching it from a consistent process, not necessarily a consistent outcome. So the fairness is in the process, not in the one size fits all, this is the way we're going to work. And that's where it's getting messy for organizations is they're trying to make that consistency happen in a one size fits all policy. Like, oh, we come in two days a week and that's every Tuesday and Thursday. And it's, but then that doesn't work for everybody. So then some teams kind of start ignoring it and then it becomes management by exception. And then everybody just starts ignoring it altogether and it doesn't work. That is the question. I also feel like, just putting on my marketer hat, I've been thinking about this a lot, that we're in the middle of a huge public narrative shift around work and its meaning in American life. We as a culture, and globally, I I can't speak for other countries, but I think this is probably true in a lot of success-driven cultures, you know, a lot of us just never question the assumption that success is what matters and work is really important. And we're seeing this huge narrative shift, first with the great resignation, now with these quiet quitting videos, with the ability to speak out and reach such a big audience. I think you have a generation of people saying, work is not my life, and why can't my employer get that? You know, Maura, I was interviewed for the New York Times in September, I think it was just September 2018. Hmm. And the article was, the next generation is going to save us from work. Or I mean, it was- <laughs> I remember that right? article. Yeah. And in that article, I said, we're misinterpreting what young people are saying when they say, I want flexibility, I want work-life balance, I want- it's being interpreted as, I don't want to work hard. Yeah. And that is not what they're saying. They are saying, we need to think about how we intentionally work and then also have a life. Yes. And sure, there are always going to be people who don't want to work hard. That is going to be the minority. Most people do want to do a very good job. They do. But they also recognize that over the last decade plus, technology and globalization, the, the traditional boundaries that used to let us just check out at the end of the day, they are gone. Gone. And we've got to be more thoughtful and intentional about thinking about not just work, but life. And then the pandemic hits. And this whole thing just gets accelerated to mock speed. And now we're on the other side of it. And we really have to talk about it now. Because not only is that generation increasingly, the younger generation who was being misinterpreted, increasingly a large portion of the workforce. So now they have a bigger voice. Mm -hmm. They're even moving further into phases of their life where they have even more pressing personal responsibilities that make thinking this through even more important to them. So let's not misinterpret. This is where I'm getting concerned is that once again, (laughs) we have leadership saying, oh, they just don't want to work hard. No, don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. No, this is legitimately them saying, how do we engage in a different dialogue about what we need to prioritize at work to do a good job, but then how do I also have a life? It's about agency, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you some listener questions and maybe add some commentary of my own. (laughs) Awesome. But- I think one of the themes that I'm hearing out there from people is I had this new sense of agency during the pandemic. Even if I was working a lot of hours, I had this control over my time that was wonderfully refreshing. So how do I, quote, go back, prove to my boss that I'm still in it, but I really love having that 2 p.m. slot to go to the grocery store. (laughs) I love going to the gym in the middle of the day. How do I get what I want while still signaling that I'm committed, right? Like I get a lot of questions like that. So can I answer it optimally? And then if it's not happening in an optimal way, is that okay? Sure. So let's talk about optimally how that is happening is that your manager is gathering you together as a team and saying, okay, so what are the parameters within which we're going to agree to work? So in other words, when we do this type of work, 
do we agree we are going to be together on site? Do we agree it doesn't matter? Do we agree it's actually better if we're all remote to do that work? And really walk through most of the priorities that you're trying to accomplish in your jobs every day. And from that process, you will begin to say, okay, so here's when I'm going to be on site when we're doing these things. Here's where I'm going to be remote. Mm -hmm. And then you want to also talk about how you're using technology with each other. Mm. What are the norms and guidelines around if I need to get in touch with you in real time, how am I getting in touch with you? What are our core hours when we agree we're going to have interactive meetings with each other, be they virtually or be them on site? Like really look through all those different aspects of what essentially is your new structure of work. (laughs) Then you have agency. (laughs) It's all been laid out. You're all on the same page. And so then you can figure out then what you're going to do and how, when, and where you're going to do it, knowing what the sort of coordinated parameters are that within which everybody is doing their jobs and managing their lives. And the reason that's important is so you don't have everybody doing their own thing. It's really inefficient and ineffective. And that's when people get frustrated yeah. because the, what you're doing is affecting how I'm able to get what I need to get done done. And that's when it doesn't really work. It's when people show up to the office and you're not there and you've agreed. It's just really messy. Now, that is optimally what would happen. Let's say that is not what's happening in your workplace. Okay, so this is where you, I believe we have the power to initiate some of this work ourselves. So what that means is you will sit down with yourself and say, okay, what do I need to do? Well, here are basically the tasks and priorities of my job. And then how and where do I do those best? Mm. And come up with a plan. And sit down with your manager and say, you know, on these days when we're doing this, I'm going to prefer to be in the office, love for others to join me, just because I think we could really all benefit from being here for this particular type of work on these days. But you know what? That's up to what everybody else decides they're going to do. But when I'm doing these things, it's actually better for me if I am remote. I am not being interrupted. Also, for my personal life, this is actually a structure that works for me for certain things I need to get done. And you can say that. You can say that without fear of being seen as lesser, less committed. And, you know, I don't think you need to get into a lot of detail. You know, I've talked about this in the past, right? Like, you can just say, this is based upon my work. Always lead with work, okay? Just made with work. Then you can say, hey, and from a personal standpoint, this structure works for me as well. Mm -hmm. And let's pilot it. And oh, by the way, if you need me quickly, please text me, please call my mobile, please send a Teams chat, but I will get right back to you. So what that does is it gives people the sense that if I need you, I can get you. Most Mm -hmm. people don't, okay? But you have set out the parameters so people understand how and where you are working so that they can then incorporate that into how they coordinate with you. Right. And that lowers their anxiety too. Exactly. But I still go back to, optimally, this is all happening at a team level. And that actually optimizes it for everybody. This question is from a medical executive who says, Basically, what I'm doing is I work from home two and a half days, and then I come into the office two and a half days. But when I come into the office, I'm just sitting in a conference room by myself doing Zoom meetings. Is this what managing is? Question mark. So this sounds like this is an executive, somebody with managerial responsibilities. Yes. Okay. A new manager, though, who used to be a clinician and is now managing a lot of people. Well, even better, right? Like, you don't have any preconceived notions on how you manage. So you can just say, hey, you know what? The way I'm going to manage my team is we're going to all get together and we're going to sit down and we're going to say, all right, what do we feel is missing from the way we've been working over the last two and a half years? And you may have some people on your team like, nothing's missing. I'm good. Okay, well, you may have other people say, I'm lonely. Like, I really miss seeing everybody on a regular basis. Okay, so what do you miss? Well, I miss us having lunch, or I miss us brainstorming, or I miss us completing this particular 
type of work we do together because I find it just is more efficient if we do it when we are in person versus virtually. Okay, so get all that laid out and then agree. Okay, so based upon what I'm hearing, one, two days a week, we will all try to be here together to do this type of work. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. And get as many people as you can on the same page. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Not everybody's going to get exactly what they want, but agree. This is what we're going to start with and try it for three months. And if you have somebody who says, let's say you agree, right, we're coming in these two days a week to do basically this type of work. And when we're together, we're going to make sure we have lunch together, or we're going to make sure we, you know, take a walk outside together so that we can enjoy each other's company. You may have a couple people say, I don't want to come in. Okay. So then that becomes their responsibility to say, Mm -hmm. how are you going to then interact and coordinate with us If we're all here, what does that look like? What technology are we going to use to make sure you can call into these meetings we're having? And how do we facilitate that hybrid meeting with you so that you feel like you're part of the discussion that we're having in person? And that then allows the next level of planning to happen. But this manager has the power to initiate that reimagining process Mm. and recalibrate how, when, and where everybody's going to work together for the team. And that's what I would say, because I bet they're not alone. I bet there are people Mm -hmm. on their team who are feeling the exact same way and a little coordination and some, you know, basic guardrail setting around what we're doing and how, when, and where we do it best. People will really appreciate it. Okay. This question is from a partner at a law firm. After 20 plus years of commuting an hour and a half a day, sitting in traffic, spending really long hours at my office in the city, I found working from home to be a revelation. I don't want to go back to the office. But my junior associates and the lawyers that I'm training are mostly back. Does this mean that I can't be partner and I have to start my own thing or go out on my own? I want to be there for the young lawyers that I'm mentoring and training and working with, but I work so much better remote. So my answer is, does it have to be all or nothing? Mm -hmm. You really do have to ask yourself that. Is there a way, because genuinely I am hearing this over and over and over again, that is a real desire and need on the part of junior talent. Yeah. They have not had that opportunity yet to get that one-on-one real time, just being with you, interacting with you, watching you interact with clients, being able to ask you a question and, and talk to you in real time to answer that question, networking with you, having you know them personally. They haven't had that. Whereas you, your 30 years of your career, you got that locked and loaded. You have your network, you've had your mentoring, you know how to do your job. But maybe looking at part of your job is this development part. And if the people you're developing really want that type of development, then maybe how do you craft a flexible work model with them? Mm -hmm. Bring them in. You know, I cannot say this enough to managers and senior people. Bring your people in. Have a conversation. Start with, hey, you really appreciate having the opportunity to have real-time interaction with me and develop by listening to what I have to say, by having me answer your questions, can we figure out a couple of days a week that we will all be together in the office, that we will make that type of work a priority Mm -hmm. and we will plan that together? You know, quite frankly, more, it's going to require more work on the part of a manager. And then you have to be thoughtful about planning to make those activities happen. But you also have to rely on your people to do their part and bring what they need developed on to you on those days. But then don't just wait for being together to be thoughtful about development, because there's a lot of that can still happen virtually. I just have a client, it's an accounting firm, and they have a team that when they do this particular part of their projects, they open up a Teams channel at the beginning of the day, Hmm. and everybody logs on at their desk, including partners. And for the next two and a half hours, they do this one part of their work together, silently, all on Teams. 
<laughs> so that as questions come up, the junior people are just like, go off mute and they're like, hey, can I just ask this question? And then they share a screen and then they do. So wow, there are ways to do this, but it starts with what do we need to do? We need yeah. to develop our junior talent. Okay, how yeah. and where do we do that best? And come up with a plan together. And it may be a couple of days in person. And just maybe that has to be okay. I think as you say that, it's so true. And and also just taking the perspective, I'm trying to, of a young person who maybe even graduated during the pandemic, they don't know what they don't know. They don't. About building a network, how to socialize at work, how to create community, how to cultivate clients. They like, don't. They've never experienced that. They don't. And I think, quite frankly, it is incumbent upon more senior management and managers to thoughtfully explain that to them, Mm -hmm. to say, Mm -hmm. you know what, during the pandemic, this is how we had to work. And there are a lot of great things that we were able to do, but there are certain things that are missing that we now have to think about intentionally how we add them back in. And what does that look like? And here are the things I see. What do you see? Mm -hmm. And then together come up with a plan. Yeah. Okay. My last question, and I hear this a lot. (laughs) So this is a composite question. This is from a manager. How do I make sure I'm fair to everyone about their schedules? I don't want to be seen like I'm playing favorites. So that's where you have to lead with the we and not the I. I am seeing a lot of this in organizations. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. Like in each person is coming to the table with their own thing. (laughs) That is just not sustainable. And this is where you've got to start off with, okay, so what do we need to do? And then how, when, and where are we doing this best? Where are we doing this work most effectively? When are we doing this work most effectively? When are we asynchronous? When are we working in real time with each other? What are our core hours? What are our norms around communicating and connecting via the technology that we have? Like putting all of that in place. And then within that structure, asking people, do you have to do anything differently from what we've all agreed? And then that's when you come up with a a plan. Hmm. The fairness is in that process Hmm. that I just laid out. You are not unfair when you walk through that process with everybody because everybody knows, oh, okay, if I wanted something different from what we all agreed to, then there is a process for me to then suggest that and come up with a different plan. So I think the, the risk is when you don't start from the we, and you start mm-hmm. with the I, there is a danger that you're going to say yes to somebody who's going to do one thing and no to somebody who's going to do something. It's like, well, why did you say yes to them and not to me? Because you right. haven't started with the what. Right. So and squeaky, squeaky wheels, right? Exactly. And if you have that we process, then everybody's pulled into the process versus the one person who's like, oh, to your point, here's what I need. Great. Right. And the other person's sitting there like, well, I don't, how do I even think about that. Right. Okay. So that's my advice is the fairness is in the process Mm -hmm. and try to execute it from that perspective and you'll reduce that risk. And and be mindful when you do have people working across different dimensions, including yourself, you have to make sure that you are intentionally managing people regardless of where they are at a particular time. And, you know, that means not just relying on the, those in-person interactions, making sure that you are connecting virtually as well. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Prinko. Many thanks to the great LinkedIn Presents family and to all of our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends or leave us a review. You can always tweet me at Mora AM or find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, leave me a message, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening.